Good to have you all with us this morning. It's, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be reading from uh, the uh, prophet Ezekiel. And uh, I was thinking last Sunday after, after the message, after church, God had given me a, well, I started thinking, I guess, I guess, well, I guess it was the Lord that gave it to me, because it, <laughs> and, and he, he, he started telling me, how many of us have heard the term passing the buck? Okay. Now, I, and, and I don't know why that, that came, and then, and then and what came to my mind is the buck stops here. Okay. Now, now how many, now I'm going to give you a piece of information that you have absolutely no need for. Okay. But I wanted to look up where the term passing the buck came from because it's like you pass the buck. And when I thought of that, I thought like a buck, like a dollar, you know, pass the buck. But that's not, that's not what it means. And I, and I got this from about three different sources, so I figure it's true. Okay, so what, what, in the Old West, how many people like to watch Westerns on TV or Western movies, you know? And, uh, you know, they're playing poker, right? They used to, like, sit in the saloon and play poker. Well, when they would do that, there was always a concern about cheating, okay? Not that, you know, cowboys would cheat. But there was a concern about cheating. And what they would do is they would have a buck knife, a big knife, on the table. And the dealer would have the knife in front of them, whoever was dealing. And when the time came, you know, one guy deals and the next guy does, they would pass the buck. And that's where that term came from, passing the buck. If a guy didn't want to deal, he would pass the buck. And that's where it came from. Now, you're probably all thinking, he's just making that up. No, I didn't. I researched this. I did that. But passing the buck, and it, and it has come to mean, you know, shirking responsibility, passing off responsibility. Of course, this week, you know, with all the news, a lot of people were passing the buck. And, you know, with what we heard, I don't want to get into all that ugly stuff. But I, 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 want, I, I just want to say that it's, it's become, uh, I think, a national pastime to pass the buck. Now, how many people remember Harry Truman? Well, you know, some of you might remember Harry Truman. <laughs> he was, he was, I think he was the last president that we had that was like a, a regular guy. He was like a shoe salesman, and he ended up in Congress, and ended up being president. He had, a, he had a thing on his desk that said, the buck stops here, because he was the president. He was responsible, and he took responsibility. How many know, how many have experienced or maybe have done this, have, you know, shirked responsibility, tried to push it off on somebody else? Pass the buck. I think this morning it's important that we make a decision that the buck is going to stop here. And when I say that, I say that maybe as individuals and also I'm speaking to the body of Christ. We just have a small portion of the body of Christ here, but the body of Christ that, that exists all over this world. I really believe that the reason why our nation is in the condition it's in is because the church has passed the buck. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about one particular denomination or one particular group of Christians. I'm talking about the body of Christ. We've passed the buck. We've expected somebody else or something else to do what God has spoken to us to do. And we've ended up where we're at right now. In Ezekiel chapter 22. And we're going to start with verse 23. Ezekiel was a prophet. Uh, of the exile. If you know anything about the history of the Old Testament, the nation of Judah, the city of Jerusalem, were taken into Babylonian exile for 70 years. They had profaned the, the, the tabernacle. They had worshipped false gods. They had turned their back from God. Uh, God sent prophets over and over and over again, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and all these other prophets to warn them, but they did not heed the warning of God. So God sent prophets and he said, I'm going to let you go into captivity for 70 years. And the history is that the Babylonians came and they took captives uh, back to Babylon and in, in three different waves they came and they eventually destroyed the city of Jerusalem, tore down the walls, destroyed the temple and so forth. And the Israelites went into captivity for 70 years. And then after those 70 years, God allowed them to return, and they rebuilt the city and rebuilt the temple. Ezekiel was a prophet of the captivity. He was one of the ones who was taken captive to Babylon. 
And God used him to speak words to his people because there were other prophets in those days who were saying, hey, this is just a temporary thing. This is just a little bump in the road. It's going to be okay. God loves us. We're his people. He's going to restore us. And Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel and some of the other prophets said, oh, no. The true prophets of God came and said, listen, you've been warned about this for like a few hundred years now, and you haven't been listening. God's going to do what he says he's going to do. How many people know that God is going to do what he says he's going to do? He's not this big old grandpa sitting up on the throne that it just says, oh, that's okay. Okay, He doesn't. He's, you know, he'll warn us. He loves us. He cares about us. He tries to tell us. He tries to uh, warn us when we're, we're getting off the path. And so often we close our ears and we close our eyes. In Ezekiel chapter 23, let's just read a little bit here this morning. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, and the her, if you put this in context, is Israel, Jerusalem, Judah, the nation of Israel. Say unto her, you are the land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation. God says, listen, everything you're going through right now, there's no rain. And he's, they're speaking of literal rain, but we also speak of spiritual rain. Sometimes it was the prophet Amos that said, there's a famine in the land, not of bread or of water, but there's a famine in the land of hearing of the word of God. I believe that we're living in a land today where there has been a famine of hearing of the Word of God. There's the Word of God. There's Bibles everywhere. There's preachers on TV 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Few of them are good. Some of them ain't so good. But the Word of God is going forth. It's there, but people aren't listening. People aren't hearing. People don't care. Just like in Israel. They don't care. He says, You're the land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation. And he begins to disseminate the way, the things that have to happen for God to send judgment. You know, our God is a long-suffering God. How many people can say, thank God? Amen. Well, I'm glad he's long-suffering with me. He's a whole lot more long-suffering than I am. He got a longer fuse than I do, okay? But when he, when he does act in judgment, it's unlike anything that we could imagine. Listen to what... Ezekiel says, he says in verse 25, there is a conspiracy. Do we have any conspiracy theorists in here? <laughs> you know what conspiracy theorists are. They're like, you know, Illuminati. And they might be right about some things. I don't know. But he said there's, there was a conspiracy back then of who? Of her prophets. Now, in these next couple verses, we're going to read about prophets, about priests, and about princes. Prophets, priests, and princes. The prophets were the ones that God would use to speak to his people. The Holy Spirit would fill up a prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Daniel or Amos or Hosea or one of the other ones. And he would speak to his people. When we hear the word prophecy, we, we think of the future, but it doesn't have to be the future. It could be something dealing with what's going on right now. The prophets were God's mouthpieces. Satan has a counterfeit called channelers. How many people have heard channelers? There are people who channel spirits, and they'll tell you they're talking to a lost loved one or so forth. They're really talking to a demon. That's Satan. Satan always has a counterfeit of everything. But there's a genuine uh, office of prophet. It was there in that day, and I believe it's there today. There are people that God uses to speak to a congregation or an individual. We've experienced the you know, gifts of prophecy in this church, speaking uh, out to, to our congregation. So there are prophets. There were prophets then. But the prophets then, there was a conspiracy amongst them. Instead of waiting to hear from God, instead of praying and fasting and crying out and pouring themselves out and travailing to hear from the Lord, there was a conspiracy. They got together. And Ezekiel says, like a roaring lion... Where have we read that before? Satan goes about like a what? A roaring lion. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. The prophets today are in it for a prophet. Okay, with a P-R-O-F-I-T. Prophets for profit. That's the same thing was going on today. And I've said, you've heard me say this so many times, you're probably sick of hearing it. People that advertise themselves as prophets probably are in it for a 
prophet, okay? They're, you know, they want to get people, and I'll prophesy. Send me, you know, 10 bucks, and I'll send you your own personal prophecy. They'll do it in the mail. They'll do it on email, okay? There's a conspiracy. He said there was a conspiracy amongst the prophets. They're a roaring lion, ravening the prey. They've devoured the souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. They have given false prophecies. They have tickled people's ears for money. They, have, uh, they were able to uh, come out and prophesy and prophesy for, for, for a wicked gain. It's like the time we're living in. See, I'm very careful when somebody claims to be a prophet. I'm very careful. I want to find out how they're living. I want to find out what they're doing. I don't expect nobody's perfect. But these are people who speak for God. In Ezekiel's day, the prophets were out to make a buck. They were out to earn money. They were taking advantage of the people. And because of their false prophecies, Judah was taken into captivity. Men were killed in battle because they listened to false prophecies. There was a conspiracy amongst the prophets. Verse 26, we read about her priests. Now the priest, where the prophet was how God spoke to the people, the priest was the ones that were the intercessors between the people and God. The priests were the one who, they would, if they would bring an offering or a sacrifice or a sin offering of some kind, they would bring it to the priest and the priest would take that and offer it on the altar. That would be an offering unto the Lord. So the priests had a very important position in being the intercessors, the intermediary between man and God. It says, the priests have violated my law. The ones who should have been so well informed about what God wanted, God's law. The ones who should have been striving to live lives that reflected what God said was right. They were the ones that have violated his law. They've profaned my holy things. The things that God said were holy, they used them for profane things. In other words, they've taken uh, the instruments that were, that were uh, anointed unto the Lord and they used them to play, you know, <laughs> whatever with. Uh, they, they, they themselves, holy vessels. They took the, the, the cups and all the things we read about it in the book of Daniel when uh, King Belshazzar wanted to profane the, the, the goblets and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the things of God. He says, they profane my holy things they have put no difference between the holy and the profane. It's like everything was the same. Now something we, have to, we need to understand, and again, I always, when we talk about holiness, we need to define holiness. You know, I've known folks, and, I've, and, and there's some folks that think holiness is a kind of way you dress or something you do on the outside. Holiness isn't on the outside. Holiness is on the inside. What's on the inside will affect what you do on the outside. Holiness is being sold out to God. Holiness is being set apart, consecrated, sanctified to the Lord. Okay? It says that they didn't put any difference between the holy and the profane. They found out that if they could use the things of the world, that might entice people to come in. We'll make them feel comfortable. I, I, always, I always promote, there's a website I always tell people about. It's called a alittleleaven.com, okay? One word, a alittleleaven.com. And if you go on that website, they have examples of what some churches are doing for their worship. They're singing Ozzy Osbourne songs in their worship service. I ain't kidding. They got, they got Britney Spears songs in their worship service. And they got dancers, not like our dance. Thank God we got anointed dancers, okay? But they got dancers. Their dancers ain't anointed. They're like, you know... They're like, like you would see on, a, on a MTV or something. That's what they have. This is their worship service. Well, people like to watch that. Man, that brings people in. It's like going to a rock concert. They got the laser lights going and, and everything. Smoke, the fog machines. Man, we should get a couple fog machines in here. <laughs> Man, it makes them feel, feel like they're... There's a difference. Listen, there's a difference between the holy and the profane. And I'm not, a, I'm not a music prude, please. Don't, you guys know me well enough. I'm not like that. But there's a difference between, if it's not lifting up Jesus Christ, if it's not talking about Jesus or God or something that's going to lead people to Christ, then listen, what, what purpose is that in the church? 
What do we have to do with that kind of stuff? I don't care if it has a beat. I don't care, you know, there are different styles of music. I'm not into that. But it gotta be it gotta be lifting up the name of the Lord. If you're leading a worship service, you need to be worshiping God. Not performing. Okay. All right. They didn't put a difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. There gotta be a difference. Listen, if we're gonna if we're gonna make a difference in our society, we gotta show that there is a difference. It's not an external, fake, uh, you know, phony face difference. It's a, it's a difference on the inside. It's a change on the inside. Somebody got, people got to look at us and say, there's something, there's something different about them. Because they're following Jesus Christ. Listen, he says, Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. They have hid their eyes from my Sabbath, and I am profane among them. See, by calling ourselves Christians and not living like Christians, we drag the name of Jesus through the mud. Okay? Dropping the ball. The prophets, the priests, and notice he talk, he's talking about the prophets and the priests. He's talking about the leaders, the religious leaders. Sometimes I think that when people get in a position of leadership, they forget the responsibility that's placed upon them. Leaders lead for a purpose. Leaders have followers. And if the leaders are profane, if the leaders are corrupt, what are the followers going to be? Now, he talked about the prophets. He talked about the priests. Now he talks about the princes, the government leaders. Her princes in the middle thereof are like wolves ravening the prey. That's, we've heard that allusion before in these passages. Looking to see what they can get. Like wolves looking for a, a, a wounded lamb. They're like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. What a picture. Is it just me? Or do it, does it seem like he's describing... Things that we see happening around us all the time. The church dropped the ball. The prophets dropped the ball. The priests dropped the ball. And the princes followed them. The, the, in this nation, the church dropped the ball. The body of Christ has not been the body of Christ. We bought into everything the world tried to sell us. And we're reaping what we sow. Hosea says you reap the wind. You, you, know, you sow the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. If you sow bad seed, you're not going to get good fruit. This is what's happening. This is what was happening. And all the other prophets, they were, they were telling him, oh, everything's okay. Everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be fine. Ezekiel said, no, it's not. There's a problem here. And you know something? Barack Obama said it. He said, it's time we do some soul searching. It's time we do. He was talking to the nation. But it's time we do some soul searching. It's time when there's stuff going on, it can happen. And don't think it ain't happening somewhere else. It's... It's time that we as a nation do some soul searching as a culture, as a society. Listen to what else he says. He goes back to the prophets now in verse 28. And he says, and her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar. The walls are falling apart. And instead of fixing them, they just kind of put some whitewash over them. Here a few years back, this side of the building, okay, which is the weather side, needed repointed. How many people, if you have a brick house, you know what, you've got to get the bricks pointed. I mean, it was so bad you could look in and see, like, the, the plaster. If we wouldn't have had that done, what would happen to that wall? It would, well, we, we could have took some sand and some water and stuck in there and made it look good. But what would have happened? First rain, gone. Ezekiel is saying, they've daubed them with untempered mortar, seem, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, thus says the Lord God when the Lord has not spoken. This is why we're told to, to try the spirits. When somebody stands up and gives a prophecy, somebody sa says something, or we hear somebody preach, or somebody stands behind this pulpit and preaches, you better, you better find out and make sure it's coming from God. Because anybody can stand up and say anything. You know, the verbal gifts are the easiest ones to fake. They are. We're good at talking, 
right? We learn how to talk. You can learn, you can learn how to talk in tongues. You can learn how to, you know, you can learn how to do the whole thing, man. Blah, blah, blah. We're good at speaking. But the word says, test, try the spirits. I have found out that God will let you know when it's coming from God when it is. And especially the leadership. Okay, these prophets, they were saying everything's going to be all right. Thus says the Lord God when God hasn't spoken. Don't you love it when somebody, when you hear something, that somebody claimed you said something you didn't say? You ever, you ever, that ever happened to you? Somebody come back to you and they say, I, I heard you said. He said, I never said that. Well, so-and-so said. Has that ever happened to anybody? Okay, now, it happens to God all the time. People saying God said this and God spoke that and God said this. God didn't say any of that. People justify sin by saying, well, God told me. God didn't tell you. God doesn't tell you to sin. No, but he'd make him a liar. Okay, now listen to what he says. It says, verse 29, now it comes to the people. We talk about the prophets, the priests, the princes. Now it comes to us. It says, the people of the land have used oppression, in verse 29, and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. They have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Listen, look at this picture. It's a picture of the way things are that prepares the people for God's judgment. It's a picture of, of a fallen society. In another place in Ezekiel, he talks about the sins of Sodom. What were the sins of Sodom? And everybody say, well, you know, they were homosexuals, this and that. That wasn't the sin of Sodom. The sin of Sodom was pride, fullness of bread, and an abundance of idleness. Read it in Ezekiel. I think it's chapter 16. Maybe I'm wrong. You look it up. Look up the term abundance of idleness. You'll find it. What's wrong with our nation? Pride. We got lots of bread. Believe me. We pick it up every Tuesday morning from China Eagle. We got lots of bread. And man, we got all kinds. Of, we got too much time on our hands. And it ends up what we're living in. Listen to what it says. Now here, here we go. This is, I read all that to get to verse 30. And the prophet says, And I sought for a man among them. I'm just looking for somebody that should make up the hedge. I'm looking for somebody who's willing to say the buck stops here. I'm looking for somebody who's willing to stand in the gap before me for that land. I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking for somebody who's willing to pray and fast for this people. He says that I should not destroy it. But I didn't find any. You see, when we talk about passing the buck, when we talk about abrogating our responsibility, we're talking about, in a sense of being members of this nation, we're talking about being willing to there's these breaches in the wall that have been made there by sin. Are we willing to stand in those breaches and say, God, I think of all the people in the, in the Old Testament that stood in the gap. Moses, he stood in the gap for his people. After they created that, made that golden calf, you read about there uh, back in Exodus, I think it's chapter 30, they made that golden calf, and God was getting ready to wipe them all out and start all over again with Moses. And Moses stood in the gap and said, Lord, if you wipe them out, wipe me out too. He was willing to take the hit, even though he wasn't one of the sinners, even though he wasn't one of the ones that, that created the golden calf, he was willing to take the hit. He stood in the gap. That's what standing in the gap means. I mean, we all pray for one another, but we're talking about some serious business here. Intercessory prayer, crying out for our nation, for our people, for our families. I think of somebody like Daniel. Daniel was taken in captivity. And Daniel didn't do anything wrong. When he went there, he was a young man. He was taken into Babylonian captivity with the other young men, and they tried to, they tried to make him into good little Babylonians. You know the story. We preached on that before. Uh, they, they changed their names, and they tried to get them, all the king, uh, get them to eat all the king's food and drink the king's wine. And all the other young men did it, but uh, Daniel and three of his friends said, not us. We're not going to uh, defile ourselves with the king's meat. He could have lost his life for it. He didn't care. But God blessed Daniel for his faithfulness. 
And if you read later on in Daniel, what did he do? He cried out in prayer for his people. And he said, God, forgive us. He didn't say forgive them. He said, forgive us. He stood in the gap. He was a man who was willing to take the hit with his people. To cry out in prayer, supplication, and fasting. And say, God, forgive your people. I think of others in the Word who were willing to give everything. And even as our sister Lori pointed out when she was giving her testimony, the ultimate example was Christ. He was a man who was willing to stand in the gap for you and for me. He was willing to take the hit for me. He was willing to be pierced. He was willing to be, have the crown of thorns placed on his head. He didn't have to. He wasn't a sinner. He didn't have to die for himself. But he did it for us. Listen to what the Lord says in Ezekiel. Because he could not find a man, he could not find one to stand in the gap. Verse 31, Therefore have I poured out mine indignation. That word indignation in the Hebrew, talk, it's talking about like foaming at the mouth. See, we love to think God is a loving God and he has great love. He showed us his love on Calvary, but he's also a God that has anger. We can't take one without the other. He says, I've poured out my indignation upon them. I've consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, says the Lord God. You remember that song? I did it my way. <laughs> Everybody said, no clap. Oh, no way. I don't want to do it my way. My way, there's a way that seems right unto man, but the ways thereof are death. Talked about that a week ago or a few weeks ago. God's crying out to his church, to his people. He's saying, listen, it's up to us to pray. It's not about voting or politics or political parties. It's not about agendas or, or platforms. It's not about that. It's about crying out and saying, God, forgive us. We're sinners, Father. We have eliminated you. Oh, isn't there something here a few weeks ago that the Congress of the United States of America decided to vote for, in God we trust. Remember that? They put their stamp of approval. In God we trust. Well, what God are they trusting in? Because if they were trusting in the right one, see, they, they won't use that, that J word. They won't say Jesus. They're saying God, God, God we trust. There's only one God, and he expressed himself. He showed himself. The fullness of the Godhead bodily is in Jesus Christ. He says, I poured out my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their head, says the Lord God. He's calling out to his church this morning, and I believe not just in this place on Catalpa Street, but there are churches all over this nation where pastors are standing up and preaching God's word and saying, listen, it's time that we repent of being, of, of passing the buck. It's time that we start saying, look, the buck is going to stop right here. I'm going to pray for my nation. I'm going to cry out. I'm going to ask forgiveness. If believers all over this land, people that claim to be Christians and truly are, would start crying out and saying, oh God, forgive our land. The people who are called by my name shall call upon me and humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways. Then, Will I hear from heaven and I'll heal their land? Our land needs healed this morning. The United States of America needs healed this morning. The church in America needs healed this morning. We've come so far. We've, we've fallen so far from where God wants us to be. Same, somebody, I say, well, you know, we don't do that here. Listen, we're part of the body. We've got to say, Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive your people. I think of when Jesus was in the garden. And we all know the story. You can read it in the Gospels. In the garden of Gethsemane. He sweat great drops of blood. He knew that in just a few short hours he would be separated for the first time in eternity 
there would be a veil of sin between him and his father. Darkness would, would fall. He wasn't going to become a sinner. He, was, he wasn't going to die spiritually. He couldn't. He's God. But for the first time, that perfect, eternal fellowship with the Father, for a time, there would be a veil there. Because he was taking upon my sin and your sin. And when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he could have said, I'm not doing this. They don't deserve it. I'm not doing this. I'm not going through this. But he said, if at all possible, if there was some other way, Father, but there's no other way. Your will, not mine. And he went to the cross. And he suffered the beating. And he suffered the piercing. And all those things that happened to him in the physical, which were horrible, but really nothing compared to when the darkness fell. And he cried out. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father never forsook him. And he knew it. But there was that blackness, that darkness, that separation that sin brings. We know that on the third day, he was resurrected. When he came to the end of his time on the cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. God was, it says in Isaiah, that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It was all done for the purpose. It was testified to so well by our sister. The purpose of giving us a hope of being forgiven, being set free from the things that bind us. You know, the blood of Jesus just doesn't give, give us a ticket out of hell. But it gives us the power to live the way he wants us to live. It gives us the power to be able to say, I'll stand in the gap. I'll, I'll, I'll take the hit. I'll, I'll, I'll identify with my people. I'll say, Lord, forgive us. We're sinners. God, heal your land. Jesus did it for us. And he told his disciples, he said, listen. He says, if I do this for you, shouldn't you do it for one another? The buck got to stop here. Got to stop here. The buck got to stop in our fellowship, in the body of Christ, in the church in the United States of America. The buck got to stop. It's time we take responsibility. Say, well, I, I didn't cause this stuff. Well, you know what? Daniel didn't cause it either. Ezekiel didn't cause it either. But they took, they took it upon themselves. I pray this morning, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that as we have read your word this morning, as we see things happening in our nation, in our society, in our culture, that we know is against your word. Father, it's so easy for us sometimes to look at somebody else and point a finger at them and say, oh, that one, or this one, that one ought to get right, this one ought to get saved, that one ought to change this, that. It's, it's easy for us to look at somebody else, but Father, I pray this morning we would take a good, hard look at ourselves. As our president said, I pray, Lord, that we would start to search our souls this morning. Oh, God. As individuals, as a body, as pastors, as leaders, as singers, as, as ministers, whatever we do, as good neighbors, as Christians, as individuals, as, as we go from into our homes and into our neighborhoods. And Father, are we living? Are we showing? Are we praying? Are we even concerned about what you think about how we live? Father, I pray that this morning we would leave this place with a sense of responsibility Father, we would no longer pass the buck. Isn't it something we'd like to blame? You know, anybody here ever blame your parents for anything? Well, my mom was like that. Rose will tell you, I do that all the time. We'd like to blame somebody. This one did this to me, that one happened, this happened over here. I got, I would, we have all these things that we could point a finger at. 
But I pray, Lord, I'm going to be able to put my hand up and say, Lord, it's me. I'm not going to point at nobody. I'm not going to look at nobody. But it's me. It's me. Father, I pray you would help us this morning. Take the responsibility. The buck stops here. Just stand, please, as we close in prayer. It's a song we sing. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Are you yielded to him this morning? Are you yielded to the Lord this morning? Have you yielded your heart? Have you yielded your life to the Lord this morning? Have you yielded your will? To the Lord this morning. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. We're going to close in prayer as always. If you need prayer for anything after the service, please come and we'll pray with you. We'll take some time and pray with you. Uh, if not, may God be with you. May God give you the, the strength to live a life and be able to tell somebody about Jesus this week. May God be able to, to show you and us and all of us those things in our lives, Father, that we would offer unto you. You might take out of our lives, cleanse us, mold us, make us into the people you want us to be, Father. We yield ourselves to you this morning. We thank you and we give you glory as we leave this place, but not your presence, Father. I pray, Lord, you would go with us, guide us, direct us, anoint us to do your will. And we'll give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. And all God's children say, Amen. 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 Shake somebody's hand and greet each other in the name of the Lord.